from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time. I am Andrew Wiebe with my partners in soccer, Matt Doyle, David Goss, 10 months of blood, sweat, tears, dozens, hundreds, thousands of hours of podcasting has all come down to this. 29 teams started the journey, 18 made it to the playoffs, two made it to MLS Cup, and here we are, December 9th, Columbus Crew, LAFC, Lower.com Field, MLS Season Pass on Apple TV. Coverage starts at 3 p.m. Eastern. We made it. We did. We are here. We are here. Welcome. Just a second to see if I'm breathing still. Are you all right? <laughs> Everybody, every, deep breaths. Yeah. Are you okay? How yeah. excited are you? Very excited for this game. I've been, throughout the week, as I've been doing preview stuff, thinking about it, getting ready, like, this one feels poised to be special i think back to mls cups in columbus i've been to i know the atmosphere will be legit i hope columbus doesn't give up a self-inflicted goal in the opening 80 seconds of the game <laughs> but you never know either way it's gonna be fun but diego valeri will be there doesn't that's a, bo- does not bode yeah, well not a great crew. omen yeah for the crew on that one for the fourth time in mls tony chani has got to get flown in and right. just give him the love he deserves great player maybe get a ar on the yeah, on the B- sideline, just B- to ensure. B-A-R yeah, now, B-A-R, yeah, different story. Different story from 2015. Fourth time in MLS Cup history, we are going to be in Columbus. First time at Lower.com Field. It's the third time in nine years. Of course, 2020 during the pandemic, 2015, and then early days when Crew Stadium was built. This is a matchup of two of the last three MLS Cup winners, Crew in 2020, LAFC in 2022. Chirundolo looking to go back-to-back. He has never lost an MLS Cup playoff game. LAFC also trying to get to the third final of the year and book their place in CONCACAF Champions Cup for next year. There's one spot remaining. If they win, they'll get it. If they lose, the New England Revolution will get it as well. We'll explain talk about their the coach. permutations. I mean, <laughs> no, explain it. If LAFC win, they'll get the MLS no, Cup spot. No, but why? Right? Because there's a spot for MLS Cup. There's a spot for MLS Cup. But if Crew win, Crew are already Correct. in. Because they have a superior regular season, their supporter shield standing right was high enough, and there were a number given out from supporter shield standing. So then that's how the revs. I would feel get like well. you're prevaricating. You don't. There's you a know? lot. Yeah. There's a look. There's a the lot. The revs of, finished fifth in the East. Yeah. And on points per game, they they were earn seventh a overall. Spot. That is wild. Yeah. No, they, they were actually they were sixth overall. Right, and fifth in the oh, so they were better than Seattle. They were better mm-hmm. than Seattle. They were two Ooh. points better than Seattle. Basically, all of the East semi-elite teams were better than everyone. This is such East Coast same. bias from it Weeby. Really Classic is. East Coast bias from Weeby. This from the guy who made me remove East all Coast the bias. ETR hates LAFC content East Coast from the rundown. Bias. You're trying to it's cover bad. your tracks. Me? Trying to put the hounds on my trail. East Coast? When I've you are the original it. LAFC hater, <laughs> word came in that even on the Total Soccer Show, you're an LAFC hater. Shout out TSS, shout out Joe Larry and Taylor Rockwell, my boys. Let me put this question to you guys. Uh, Ten months ago, we sat down on this show, the, the, one of the last season previews, and I tell you, guys, I guarantee you, ten months from now, MLS Cup is going to be Columbus Crew hosting LAFC. If last year's final, those two teams meeting, was like the least shocking mm-hmm. final, like one of the, the least shocking final two teams in MLS history, where would this one rank? Like a three out of ten? Like, yeah. I don't think either or any of us are surprised at either of these teams being here. There's yeah. zero out of ten for LAFC, given their defending champions, Denny Bawanga, the money that they've spent. And the West the being down that they this had. year. Yeah, the that's West fair. But down. we didn't know that was necessarily going to we kind of suspect. be the case. Well, we can mm. quibble. Crew, I would say, would occupy the three. Wolford Nancy's first year, knew they had the talent, didn't know if they had the back line. Yep. Still, that was question marks during the season. Uh, doubts about game model in in the playoffs, and this is like we we wrote it down in the in the rundown. Like, what I'm most excited about, what I'm most excited about, is to see this game model tested in MLS Cup. By that I mean um, Columbus are not only a heavy possession team; they are a heavy possession team that takes what would be considered completely wild risks with who and how many they're sending up and when uh, into the attack. Uh, any other team in the, in the league, other than maybe Houston, like doesn't 
doesn't really do that. And we've seen heavy possession teams win before. Ten years ago, Sporting Kansas City was a heavy possession team, but they did it in a different way. The team they played, uh, RSL, with that famous diamond with Kyle Beckerman, Javi Morales, and two great forwards, two great shots. Oh, that was a very heavy possession team, but it was way more compact and structured and done for defensive reasons. Uh, with this, I mean, this is – all gas, no brakes type of soccer, man. <laughs> and I am, I'm just absolutely thrilled to see the, Colum- the Columbus crew make it this far playing this kind of soccer. Um, yeah, like that. that is the 3 out of 10, right? That is the one that is more surprising. Yeah, I, I just looked at it. My preseason rankings, I had Columbus fourth in the East. I had LA. We were all big believers. So, yeah. We were all big believers in Wilfred Nancy. We all saw what he did over the course of his time in Montreal, and we all love this type of soccer. But there, until a team gets to this stage and then wins MLS Cup, there's always going to be doubt that that kind of open – risk-taking, attacking soccer from back to front can get the job done in the biggest game. For sure. Now, I think for Columbus, the thing was they were close last year to make the playoffs, and the talent we knew was there, where if you had said preseason, Houston will be in the conference final. Oh, shocked. We would have been more shocked yeah, than this. Yeah, absolutely. So that's where like Columbus not as far off, but I agree with you that there was question marks going through it. I would say there was question marks coming into the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Even after a somewhat a decent amount of proof of concept from them. We did not know what it would look like in the postseason. We didn't know how Cucho would look in the postseason. We didn't know who would elevate their game. I mean, they looked bad that second game against Atlanta. And we didn't know if they'd be able to hold the medal of, like, will they play this way and play well in these high-pressure moments. Uh, yeah, they got played off the field for large parts of that game against Atlanta, and it looked like the holes of, like, they'll score, but they'll give up four. It was the high-pressure moments, right? I mean, they were – were they the league leader? I think if they weren't, they were right there and points given up yep. from winning positions. I, I, think was, only, I think only Charlotte gave up more. It was more than 20. It was yeah. chronic all season long of, hey, look, winning games, tying games, in position to have huge results and not walking away with it. And then they showed that gene certainly against Orlando, less so I would say at Atlanta. That was just a great Atlanta performance. But they'll they'll open it up. Like there's a reason why Cincinnati could have been up three, four, nothing against this team. You are still believing in guys like Rudy Camacho and Maldi Edmondson and Marrera to both go forward with the ball, but also defend one v one in space. I mean, their center backs are Rudy Camacho, who is very good on the ball, but doesn't cover a lot of ground defensively and just questionable defensively overall. Rudy Camacho and two converted fullbacks. That's their center back core. We have not seen this type of thing before in MLS Cup this stage of the season. Also, Odmanson wasn't even a starting fullback at this finish at NYCFC, and Camacho had lost his starting spot at Montreal this year. Boom. We Look, there's so much to go into. Oh, we're well, gonna... playing in front of MLS Next Pro goalkeeper, and, you know, it just makes things easier. We're deep diving this whole thing. That's what the entire episode is about. Again, coverage starts on Apple, MLS Season Pass at 3 p.m. Eastern, full hour pregame show on site, Columbus, LAFC, 4 p.m., Apple, Fox, find a way to watch it. I believe it's free on MLS Season Pass, so no excuses on that sense as well. History could be made here. The crew could become the third team with more than two MLS Cup victories. Name the other two. It should be very easily for you. Just all time? All time. All time. LA Galaxy. And? Who am I missing? Seattle? DC, DC United. Wow. I don't understand victories. Oh, penalty kicks don't count as victories? No, no, no. D- DC Just have... How many MLS Cups have you yeah. won? But you said more than... Oh, more than two. I yeah. thought you said had two. Yeah, more than two. More, yeah. <laughs> what about the Houston Dynamo? Yeah, sorry. They have two. What about the Dynamo Quakers? It doesn't <laughs> count. They're different clubs. I got to work on Dom my... Kinnear struggling, needs credit for Struggling with my phrasing here on these trivia questions for I, I, Honestly, we, I think that one was on David. Okay. <laughs> I was <laughs> trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. Try to, just try it. Wolfram Nazi uh, also going that, that's for... That's East Coast bias. Yeah. Uh, he was really... I thought that's what it was. He was solidifying his West Coast bias. He was like, oh, yeah, Seattle for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Wolfram Nazi going for his uh, first MLS copy, Cup, obviously, in his first season in Columbus. He's also the first black coach to lead his team to an MLS Cup final. So history there, maybe not the history uh, that you want to celebrate in a macro sense, but in a micro sense for Wilfred, uh, the beginnings of something that you hope is a trend going forward as well. Black Players for Change had that stat, and uh, we're thankful to them for bringing and shining light to that. 
The referee crew, just to get it out there, just so you know who's on the field, who's making the calls, Armando Villarreal will referee his second MLS Cup in three years. He was also the referee in 2021. Your VAR is Kevin Stott. It is his seventh MLS Cup, three as the referee, three as the fourth, and his first as the video assistant referee. So that'll be your crew for the game. You already jumped ahead. Yep, Most sorry. excited about. It's all good. thing I'm most excited about is being on the field when a team wins something. Mm. I've said it on this We've podcast got the call up. many times before. There's nothing like being on the field when the confetti hits the air, the moment the final whistle is blown, when staff members are finding players, players are finding each other, family members are starting to hit the field, and you just feel this sort of flood of exhilaration, but also not an insignificant amount of disappointment. And it's that sort of dichotomy of emotions, of reactions, in that moment that everybody's been working toward for 10 months where you really get a feel for viscerally what these players, these clubs, these coaches, these administrators, these support staff folks, everybody has been working for for not just a year, but longer. It's the best part about this job. I believe I will be in a position to – I'll be on the stage, I think, with Commissioner Don Garber. I, I don't know what my role is other than to say, this is Commissioner Don Garber. I, I don't know if I get to touch the cup. I think he. Well, gets, you I don't, shouldn't. You don't want to curse yourself because yeah. you've never won it. Well, you right. used to have to touch the. No. Yeah. You, gloves. you you wore the white Always gloves. gloves. Yeah. yeah. The Tiffany gloves. gloves. Right. Yeah. So I don't, I'm not like the cup handler, but I'm I'm in the mix here on stage with whoever wins it. We, that's, that's cool. All right. Final whistle blows. Doesn't matter who wins. Um, they're setting up the the stage and everything. They bring the cup out. You. Do I sneak a touch? You see? No. You see your moment. Not for a touch. You grab the thing. Two-handed and you, grab. Two-handed grab, and you run for it. Who do you think is the first one to track you down and take you down? Who 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 do we think wins in this scenario? Because I'll tell you, in 2016, when I was the handler, Ozzy Alonso would have taken me out. Oh, yeah. Because he tried to get the cup out of my hands multiple times before it was ready. I will say, though, and you have breakaway speed. No, I don't think so. Weeby does. No. I'd say I, I think Chiellini's probably on your I was going to think heels. Uh, I think Nagby as well. Denny Bawanga. Just, no, because you know, is a goal scorer, dude. He's well, yeah, but you know that the you know that the burst at that moment is no, but he's he going to be going care. full yeah. speed because he, he's got his golden boot trophy, he's got his MVP. He's going to get his his yeah. silverware. I will I will say, dark horse here, someone who's been there before, Aiden Morris. Aiden Morris knows the drill in this situation, and like he's the crew home going. So if the crew win and Weeby tries to make off with that trophy. I think Aiden Morris is two-footing him before he gets 10 steps. Yeah. I'm not touching that trophy with two hands. I will sneak the finger I touch, will give though. you 10 bucks. <laughs> oh, it's tempting. It's so tempting. So what when you-, you tune in on Saturday and Weeby's not on the stage, <laughs> this is why. Uh, yeah. I'm not going to do this, Commissioner. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Dave, what are you most excited about? There's a lot. I mean, we're, we're going to go through a lot of it. So there's not one specific thing. But I think the first thing that just popped out is um, in a big game, you talk about stars. You talk about big moments. And in this game, it's Cucho Hernandez and Dennis Buanga. And it's players who I think are hopefully uh, models for the next wave of stars in this league coming at the age they did, at the profile they are. You know, Cucho working his way into the Colombian national team, 24 years old. Buanga leads Gabon, coming from league on becoming a golden boot winner in his second season and now potentially winning back-to-back MLS Cups. But guys that can play every game, that can lead, you know, minute in and minute out because they're at that age, they are both game-changing signings in Major League Soccer, and they have both already shown that they are up for the big moments. They've both played phenomenal in this playoffs. Neither of their teams here, if if it wasn't for them, Buanga's done it now in multiple competitions for LAFC. So it's – there are – you know, I, we'll talk about it over – the course of the show like there are weak link games where like oh you know this team's gonna lose because this guy's not maybe as strong or whatever this feels like one of those games where it's if one of these two plays an all-time great game their team's gonna win because that's how good they are and it's fun to watch them do their thing and there's no doubt about it that both of these guys are capable of playing an all-time great game in this circumstance because like they've shown it before yeah it's been i mean cucho has been special over the course of this season, but especially since Zellerion. Actually, even when Zellerion was there of finding his spots, being a creator, right? He spent the first half of the season as the assist 
playmaker coming off the left side and then being the center forward, scoring some ridiculous goals, scoring in huge moments, scoring against the run of play at times against Atlanta. And then at times then when Christian Ramirez comes on, drops in and plays. Buanga, we spend every week talking about how he's the one player to stop and no one has found a way to stop him. The Seattle goal is one of the great MLS playoff goals of all time. Against the run of play again, everything's going against you. You're in one of the atmospheres in MLS history that's hardest to play in. And what he did at full speed with the poise he had in finishing it, that's going to be, I think, maybe even if they win, the goal that you walk away from this run for LAFC with and you talk about and you think about. And both of them are are just awesome when they're in their moments. It's going to be fun. 4 p.m., that's game time, 3 p.m. pregame. Matt Pollard hit us up and said Columbus is regularly talked about with an underrated MLS away day city and a good place for foodies. Where is Andrew Wiebe uh, going pre-post game? What are you guys getting at Bud Dairy? I didn't know what Bud Dairy was. I had to look that one up. It's a food hall. I'm going to go with the Filipino street food mm. from Bud Dairy. That like looked, pretty, uh, yeah, looked, looked pretty attractive to me. As far as a place I just got to go, for whatever reason, I don't know who started this with us. Was it... Charlie Fiction, was it Sound Abner, bad. whoever? Charbar has always been the spot, and I made that reference last time. It is a – it's a dive. You know, it's the sort of place where, like, the carpet smells like Saturday nights from the last 35 years. But it's also one of those places – it's pure democracy. Everyone's equal. You yes. walk in there, it doesn't matter how many World Cups you've played in. You're getting a cheap beer, and you're standing around, and it's great. Or you're getting a Long Island – yeah. And you're going to try to limit yourself to oh, one yeah. Long Island because you might be in trouble if you go for two. So that's that's the one place I know I will find a way to. I don't know when or how. Do you go out how. of your way for, for the hot chicken? Because I know na- like hot chicken is a Nashville thing, but I know Columbus has an excellent hot chicken. There I will is, go out of is? my way generally for hot chicken. But I arrive Friday evening, and I've got a pretty packed schedule. So hopefully something's open late night, and then we'll we'll sort of go from there. All right. Yeah. Doyle undefeated and getting hot chicken into every I know. food conversation. I, I, I thought you were going to have a like a Middle Eastern spot. I to do. Go to. It's called Brasica. It's like in Short North, I think, right on the main strip. I do believe though that North Star Cafe is the place. That ah, yes, that's always been the breakfast spot. So yeah, maybe get there yeah, on. Uh, I think I have a later flight on Sunday, so that might be a good sort of soak up the 4 p.m. local is prime kickoff of like, yes, not for you because you're working, but for real people. We're like, you can enjoy some time before, get yourself ready, but it's not 7 p.m. where you've right. already peaked and right, now you're back yeah. down. Hit noon, and then so you don't have to, you know, for those it, of you of age or who enjoy this sort of thing, you can have your adult beverages at a reasonable hour mm-hmm. or exactly. an unreasonable hour up and to you. And then have I, more afterwards. Exactly. And you get a little bit of the, like, sun coming in, but you want this game under the lights, right? Yeah. And you get there. So it's kind of like an ideal kickoff. I think last year in L.A. was pretty early. Local time, Seattle was as well. And then some in the past, like in Toronto, were very late and cold. So I think this will be an ideal one. Who's the favorite in this game? We checked uh, BetMGM. You know how good we are at betting lines of any plus, minus, whatever any of that means. It's plus 125 for the crew, plus 200 for LAFC. So BetMGM has the crew as, I don't know how much of a favorite, but certainly a favorite. Yeah, it seems slight, but... It, it seems like mainly just home field, like maybe even less than normal in home field in MLS, which is they're hosting their favorites, but it's pretty much 50 50. Do you know what the home record for the crew is this year at Laura.com and MLS and MLS Cup playoff games? I do not. If you had to guess, what would you guess? Um, they've won 11 home games. They've won more than that. Oh, ni- yeah? They have 19 home games in those two competitions. So maybe they've that gives won you- more than 11 Correct. home games? No, that's impressive. Yeah. Uh, 14 wins. 14. Stop. Ding, 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 ding. They won 14 of 19. 14 of 19. They've won. They've not won. gotten results. Correct. How many did they? How many have they lost? Just tell me. One. One. Okay. One yeah. loss. Wow. I believe plus over plus 30 goal differential in those 19 games. Welcome so that, to Columbus. Welcome to the Thunderdome. Yeah, uh, c- clearly so. So that's where some of that, uh, that favorite status comes from. LAFC are basically bang 500. On the road, which is very good on the road. Yeah, across all, across all competitions, I think they're like eight wins, seven losses, nine draws, something like that. So yeah, just about five hundred. But obviously, they've been fantastic on the road in the playoffs. And what we saw in um, in Seattle, having twenty eight, twenty nine percent possession and playing on the like, they're so comfortable doing that. 
Did they get eviscerated at Ala Valencia? Was that this year? Yep, that was at home. They won at Ala Valencia. Oh, yeah. And then they got yeah, yeah. They right. They smoked them on the road. On the road, which was supposed to be the toughest. Because and they were and they were playing against the ball. Right. Right. And we should have we should have realized. And then they went home and they tried to carry possession and they were terrible. Um, they, they advanced anyway, but then what? They beat the I think they beat the hell out of the. Um, the union after that, yep. and then they had the two legs against Leon, and they went down there, and they were bad in Leon, um, but they got that late goal from Buanga, I want to say it was, and they lost two one, and we thought, oh great, they'll go home and they'll carry play, and they, and they came home and they were not able to carry play, and they yeah they lost that second leg, um, but that's, I mean it's ancient history now. It feels yeah. like it was three seasons. No, ago. it feels it feels like a different third league. final of the year. If we haven't already stated that many times for LAFC. CCL, Campeones Cup, now MLS Cup. What would a win or loss mean for the crew? Let's go big picture, then we'll sort of narrow it down and get granular. What would it mean, Dave? You probably have to start with just a validation of all the work that was done to reestablish the club and restart the club, basically. The fans, the Haslams, Tim Bezbachenko, all these players, they have become a standard setter on all fronts in MLS, whether that is, you know, Tifo Sweat and what the fans represent. And I'm so happy, by the way, for the fans that some of the Issues that they had with ticketing early on have been addressed, and it seems like more and more season ticket members and Nordeca folks are able to get into the game. That is absolutely what what should happen for people that have been there all season long and committed so many hours of their lives uh, to something like this, and also just to make it the best possible environment. So I'm happy for them, but man, it's it's the fans, it's the front office, it is the ownership certainly with the building of lower.com and yeah, the conversion 100%. of their training facility. I mean, the crew have become a model club. Yeah, they are. And they will be whether they win this game or not. But I think winning this game just because of how tough 2020 was and the way things were, and you don't have all your fans and it wasn't lower.com field yet. I think this would be that celebration moment of like, yeah. you have rebuilt a rebirth of this club, of this soccer market, of what it means as a soccer market in the American soccer landscape. All these things that Columbus has meant that the sport means to fans in Columbus, it would be the cherry on top. It would be that moment for them to sort of have that release of like, this is it. We're we've re, we're here. We're going to be here for a while, and you know, a lot of Major League Soccer runs through us. I think it would be validation for the Haslam's as well as for Tim Bezbachenko and the people that work for him of all of these beliefs they had of how to run an organization, how to run a club, how to run it efficiently, how to run it, I think, morally at a high level. And so I think there's a lot of that that a victory in this moment would be a celebration for. If they lose, it doesn't change all of the great things we just talked about. It doesn't change – the belief to bring Nancé in and what he could do for that team and landing on Cucho as their star player and the way they've built up from the bottom through the academy, the way they invested in MLS Next Pro, the two finals they've been to there. It doesn't change any of that, but you want that moment to be able to have a parade, have a party, have a celebration, and be able to sort of say it in front of everyone. So I think big picture, that's what this weekend could be. I think if you see, if you're standing on the field, giving the trophy there and the crowd's just going nuts and then the whole city's alive with it. I think that's sort of that potential that you could have. It is a cathedral moment. We knew crew stadium was that in a different way, in a different that stadium era bounces on a good day, but lower.com could have their first sort of big moment yeah. in that sense. Campeones cup. They won there as well, but, but you want the like parade into and the parade out of and, People just flooding straight into the city because it's a downtown stadium, which was what they worked for and what they wanted and being celebrating a championship. Doyle, if the crew win, and to Doyle's, uh, Dave's point, maybe even if they don't, would that be a coronation of sorts for Wilfred Nancy as perhaps the elite soccer mind in MLS? I mean, it would be proof of concept and um, that he is in that discussion. Right, that he he is one of the guys who, if you're making a list of who's the best coaches, and isn't he already in that discussion? I I think so. Squarely so. I mean, I I, I was on a call with Pat Noonan ahead of the conference mm -hmm. final, and Pat basically was like, he's the coach that I'm most impressed by. Yeah, and remember what Jim Curtin said last year when when Jim won Coach of the Year, he said I thought Will Fernandez was the best coach this year. So like he already among his peers and among us. But if they don't win this, 
any random will be, you know, random fan or, or hater, you know, unrandom hater, because there are going to be a lot of those in Cincinnati these days, will point to Will Fernandez and say, you mean the guy with no trophies? Yeah. And I think that's BS. I think, it, like, if I was starting, a, you know, if I won a billion dollars and bought an MLS team. Maybe like, two billion. Maybe two billion. I, I would... I would try to hire Will Fernandez. I think he is that good a coach, and I think that the best move any club made this past offseason was when Columbus did whatever it took, and we still don't know. Um, they Obviously, there had to be some sort of monetary compensation, but they did what it took to get Will Fernandez. And I think this was the first time any MLS team had kind of done that with another MLS team. So that tells you how he's thought of. Um, yeah, I mean... God, win, win MLS Cup in your first year with a back line that has two fullbacks and one center back, and you know you're playing two attacking wing backs and developing kid. Like, yeah, you you probably have that probably have that crown. And you talked about what you're most excited about about watching this game model in this moment. It's a copycat league. Mm-hmm. So as a neutral, if Nance is successful in doing what he's done the entire run in this game, I think it also for the rest of the league becomes a you can play that way and win. Yep. And with Nance, there is a path to how he became a head coach of coming up through youth ranks, not an elite player, where he has developed as a coach inside of Major League Soccer, mainly in Montreal, where I think there needs to be more focus from clubs of who are future coaches and what can they be and how do we support them to get them to the next level. Now, I think Nance did a lot of that himself. Mm-hmm. He wasn't maybe properly supported. But in a copycat league, you're hoping now – other clubs look at it and say, who could be our nonce? Who's in our club already as current players, former players, current academy coaches, whatever it is to say, okay, you see talent. Because with players, talent is obvious. With coaches, there are different things that are not as easy to see. But with nonce, I think you've seen now an ability where his belief, right, and the way he carries himself has elevated players that are not considered elite to perform at an elite level. And your hope, my hope is – other clubs go out and try and copy that. Other clubs outside of MLS might decide they want to copy that. Yeah. If the crew win, does it put a timer on Cucho and Nancy's time in Major League? I mean, I think realistically that timer has already started ticking. For right. both or for just one? I think for both. Uh, what Nancy has done, we've seen coaches now, it's not a ton, but a, a number of coaches have left MLS for jobs in big five European leagues. And Nancy. Dyla. Dyla, um, Jesse Marsh, of course, Patrick Vieira, right, right, and like the profile's different, and anytime it's Red Bull to another road, so it's a little different. So even in that situation, Nance would be kind of you know a little bit groundbreaking, but he's got connections in yeah. France, and like you could like they can watch film and see how good the crew are, and see that he's doing it not just with Cucho and Diego Rossi, but taking guys who were spare parts or guys who were distressed assets like Alexandre Matan and turning like helping him realize his potential. And like every club in the world other than like four clubs are selling clubs, every single club in the world. So if you're in like, All of them in France, except for one, are selling clubs. So if you see a coach who could win, who could play, you know, coach a style that is going to entertain your fans and is going to make your young players better, that's all going to make you more money. And so, yeah, the the timer is is ticking on on Nancy's time in in MLS, I think. And Cucho, like the moment he got here, the timer started ticking. And now that he's into Colombia's national team and hopefully keeps playing like this so we get to see him in Copa America next year. Like, that's just the nature of the business. It's a good thing. And what we've seen over the past couple of years with Tim Bezbachenko and that front office and the ownership, they are willing to do what it takes to spend, to continue, to create a, a club that year after year after year at least has a chance of getting here. LAFC are back. They know how to do it too, and they had some turnover, yeah, big time turnover in this club from the champions in 2022 to 23. If they win this, Dave, that's dynasty status. Yep, yeah, that's it's back to back. It's it's all timer stuff. Yeah, it's you know every championship is history, but to go back to back at a time when I think a lot of people don't didn't think it was possible in Major League Soccer because of roster constriction and turnover, and then you add in. 
the level of competitions they had to compete in this year and still to make it. So to set the record for the most uh, games played by a club in a year and bookend that with a championship on both sides and winning MLS Cup, it would go down as a dynasty, would go down as one of the great runs in MLS history. And I think it would continue on after this, right? If you get that win, Buanga's happy, he's staying. Chirondolo's happy, he's staying. Oliveira going forward for next season. Ryan Hollingshead seems like he'll be there. Maxime Crepeau could be there for a while. You bring back Murillo, um, Ilya Sanchez. Like, There's a lot there that you can continue to build around with proof of concept that you can mix and match pieces around it and still win. So I think when you talk about this club, you're going to talk about the Bob Bradley era at the beginning, the beautiful soccer, the points record, you know, one of the great expansion teams ever. And then he leaves, but they, I think last year still was a continuation in with Carlos Vela in the group and some of the other originals in this group. The way he has played over the course of this postseason, it's not going to be a Vela-led championship. And I think if they win this, you talk about the history they've set, and I think now the path forward being solidified as this is Buanga and Chirondolo's club. And that is a winning formula, no matter who else is around them. And that gives you the confidence of how you build. Also, there's a CONCACAF Champions Cup, again, to go back and try to, you know, take care of business not quite done from last year. That would, you assume for this club, given everything else they've yeah. accomplished, be like the, you know, the cherry on top, the, the monkey on their back, the thing that they want to get done to get to the level that they think they should be at based on their investment, based on their profile, based on everything that they've accomplished – Getting to the Club World Cup and being regional champions is, I mean, if you're, if you're, it was that case last year. Now, if you have the two Pete, you would think it would be even more so. Absolutely. And it's something that they have to do because just as I was talking about how Wilfred Nance's peers regard Wilfred Nance, like there's a lot of that for Steve Terundolo as well. There's a lot of high regard for the job John Thorrington has done yeah. because remember, so. after 2021, they didn't rebuild this club by going out and getting high profile, you know, world dominant DPs. They did get Gareth Bale and he didn't do much until the last touch of the ball in that 2022 season. They rebuilt this club by going out and dominating MLS teams in the interleague market. They brought in Elie. They brought in Maxime Cripeau. They brought in Ryan Hollingshead. They brought in a ton of other guys. Kellen Acosta. Kellen Acosta. Aaron Long is a free agent. No. Well, that was the that was this most recent right. window. But so the like the genesis of this run for LAFC was their ability to get it done inside the league. And they have shown already with the double last year their ability to be the best club in MLS. If they win this or if they lose, they're going to go into next season with fans saying, Yeah, but they did they didn't get it done against uh, Liga MX clubs. And just like that's not entirely fair if that's the criticism against Nance, it's not entirely fair if that's the criticism against LAFC, but also it's factual. They have never beaten a Liga MX team um, in a championship game, and they've had three cracks at it now. They might not get another one next year. Now, they, they will be in League's Cup, but if they don't win this, they're not in – CONCACAF Champions Cup, um, that will be the first thing from their mind on Saturday, though. They're they're playing for one reason. It's not to get in the next year's yeah. CCC. It's, it's to win the damn thing. In just the context of talking about what they've been through this year, what they've played in, if they go to three finals and lose all three, we just have – we, we don't have a way to put it in an MLS context because up until a few years ago, there, there really wasn't three finals to play in. Like you could have played an Open Cup or a Canadian Championship, and you could have played an MLS Cup and CCL. So there was those three potentials, but Campione's Cup, League's Cup, those are new. It's tough to sort of find a, a comparison and just – I'm not a rings culture person. So to me, you make three finals. Knicks and Jets fan? Yeah, not a rings culture and a Mets guy? fan. It's just like you've made – you know, you've done great things. And I've said this a few times over the last few weeks when you keep asking, can this team win it? What do they need to do? Of like, I already thought Houston had a successful season. Columbus proved a lot of things. It was a big year for Orlando. Like, there's a lot of things that I think can already happen. I, I don't know how to, to, to state, like, coming out of it, what this LAFC season is. And I think the comps are last year for Philly, they lost an MLS Cup. They lost in the CCL semifinals. Um, and they lost the Supporter Shield on goal differential or yep. points, whatever it was, or by one Wins. point. On wins, yeah, yeah. 
um, because their goal differential was insane last year. So, like, that's kind of one. Red Bulls have had some years. But most of the years where teams have lost multiple semifinals or whatever, they've won a supporter shield which LAFC didn't this year because they played 50-plus games in 18 different This will be their 53rd, 53rd game. I think, and and maybe this is soft, I think it's already a successful year for LAFC because just getting to CONCACAF Champions League final, getting to MLS Cup, above 50 points again, weathering the storm of injuries and fatigue and tired legs going on the road and beating a Seattle team that had been their nemesis in the postseason. Um, finding having, finding the new shining light of the club in Denny Luanga. Yeah. I mean, you know, that transition year with Carlos Vela when he signed the year-and-a-half deal was sort of like, well, what are we doing here? Like, is this a, a delay on moving forward with the future of your club? And then Denny arrived and there were question marks early because he didn't immediately – go gangbusters in front of net, but my God, this year is a different level. Yeah. Perhaps even a better level than Carlos Vela ever set in Major League Soccer. He's at 37 goals, 38 in all comps is the record. That's Carlos Vela's. Yeah. No, it's 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 been remarkable. So I think it's a successful year already. I would understand, though, why fans would not feel that way um, if they don't win this thing. And I certainly would understand if, like, why galaxy or seattle fans would like point and laugh and be like haha you guys just you keep losing in the final 2022 was you know it was a fluke but to the point about the fans that's a credit to the club yep that you've developed a fan base that has a singular galaxy expectation. aren't even relevant <laughs> exactly <laughs> I, I mean i was going to bring this up like if they win this as if there was a question there would be no question that the top team in la is yeah. certainly lafc and that the galaxy are extra down bad because not only are you down bad, but you have to go hire Will Kuntz to be your GM to save your bacon to even think about competing yeah. what's with the last, LAFC. What's the last club in MLS that's won back-to-back MLS Cups? It's LA Galaxy. Can't say that anymore if LAFC wins this, right? Fair, You've yeah. literally lost. As each piece of LAFC increases, you're losing your history but if of they you're don't, the leader. But if they don't win, They'll right, then, then Galaxy fans will say, you know what, we have three open DP slots and a new CSO. To new, <laughs> like, so, yeah. And they'll say, they'll be, they'll say to, to LAFC fans, yeah, it was a one-off thing. And it won't. I don't think it'll be true, um, but I would understand why, and I would understand why that would stick in LAFC fans' craw. Um, I, I, the thing that that Weeby said um, before the show, and he, he was too afraid to say it. On I the was show. about to say it. I was just waiting. Go ahead, my go mind. ahead, do it, do it. I, every league needs a villain. LAFC have villainous tendencies, at least in the mindset of other fan bases, whether it be their perception that LAFC gets. Lots and lots of coverage from people like us or... Never seen him get an unfriendly whistle. Or a ton of love. And this game has a little bit of... Has a little bit of, like, Empire Rebel (laughs) to it. You know what I mean? Like, the crew are Bambi and LAFC are the Hunter. Just in terms of style of play, in terms of... There is, I mean, there is... We signed Gareth Bale for, you know, half a season to come win us a title. And, you know, you have Wilfred Nancy and Sean Zawadzki. Like, there's just a... There's Ooh, an under- Sean Zawadzki catching a stray there. Not a stray. That was a compliment to Just Sean Just like Zawadzki. different type of global profile right. yeah. between yeah. Gareth Bale. Well, Georgetown is an elite program. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, that's the there, there, the there is an el- or- there is an element of like of to bring it back to a different Los Angeles team from a different era. Just win, baby. You know the Raiders of, of the late seventies and early eighties, where sure you know they the aesthetics were out. The window. But well, wasn't Seattle this, right? Seattle went and won MLS Cup without taking a shot. They were around all the time. They were, at the time, one of the higher investors mm-hmm. in the players they had, but they didn't care the way it looked for all of those years. No, I, I don't disagree, but that was a great final. thing for the league. Yeah. It, to yeah. have I think that people hate that... win. Uh, t- other people hate teams that win, no matter yeah, what. Yeah. LA is an And, and whose fans so they perceive of being a little bit entitled to that status within the league. Do you think... Oh, hunters, hunters, hunters. <laughs> Do you think that... Fans would feel the same way to a lesser degree about Columbus if Columbus win this? Yeah, I think Columbus is not as large. It's not a city that most sports fans probably already dislike for most things. Unless you're a Big Ten guy. How would you describe LAFC? Sort of inevitable. Yeah. 
You know, like it, it's like it's like the death. Mo- like dun 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 dun. <laughs> you know, Steve Chirundolo. Are we gonna have to pay royalties for that? Probably. I'm a little bit worried. Yeah, we'd we be stuck on his. <laughs> that, what song was that? I don't even know. I don't even know what song that is. Uh, Steve Chirundolo was not exactly the most for as brilliant a coach as he clearly, clearly is, and as brilliant a player as he is. He's not like the most emotive guy on the sidelines or in interviews. He's not somebody that you're just like okay. grabbing onto his personality. Let, let me ask this. Club America, Tigres, Man City now, Man U, Barca Real. Like, are they that you think to MLS, or you think it's just because of this run? I think they can be that. Got it. Based on their level of investment, based on the management that they have, based on the quality of player that they're attracting, based on their track record here. Like, from the start, they have been at the very top of the league outside of one year. It was one down year, really. And the rest of it was... Hey, we're the best. Come knock us off. Now that hasn't always equated to trophies. It never does in MLS. There's a crapshoot element to the playoffs. But if you start making that crapshoot look like something that you can handle pretty regularly, which LAFC is doing, we should praise John Thorrington. We haven't mentioned. Yeah, yeah, we, we a couple times, but in passing. Yeah, he like the the work he did to build a roster that could compete to win across multiple competitions this year um, and keep themselves together right into the very last game of the season. Uh, uh, you know, they win this. We talk about legacies. We're talking about him probably in the same, like the the, the upper, upper echelon of MLS chief soccer officers. Yeah, and he, in similar to the other ones on that list with like, for the most part, Garth Lagerway, Tim Bezbachenko. By, by the way, that's all time, too. That, that's yep. not just in the sense of yeah. this season, this era, right now. That's If you go win back-to-back and you build an expansion team of this quality and sustain it, that's all time. Absolutely. A lot of the other all-time ones are were double coach, right? Bruce Arena and, yep. and Peter Vermees and guys like that. But I think what you see with Thornton here, similar to what you see with Bez in Columbus and the group under him, and is – while we all fall in love or, you know, a lot of fans only see and hear the head coach, you have to have an overall vision of like John Thornton will now over the course of four or five years, won trophies with his club with two separate managers Mm -hmm. because he is the consistent. He is sort of the vision going forward where the specific coach is not as important. I think that's safer for a club. Like you need someone like that to be able to keep the train on the tracks if it falls apart under Caleb Porter and you don't know how to close out games, you bring in a new manager, but you don't have to redo the club. And so this is why CSOs are so important to the clubs that they build because they are the one thing where it's less result-oriented. So you can have that overall guiding vision as long as you have a clear idea where you're going to go. And John Thornton had that. And in saying, I talked about it being a copycat league, like they lost to a team in Seattle in 2019 when they were the best open team in MLS that sat in and countered them. And he has moved... To to he has taken that on and he has moved to a style that fits that more that has now won more trophies um going forward in cup competitions and i think that's not a coincidence and i don't think it'll stop anytime soon all right let's dive into the game i mean we have nerded out on all manner of things the legacy stuff is super interesting no it is it's it really that's what's at stake i mean that's why finals are so fascinating it's why the occasion gets blown up to a different level than any other game it's because there's something much larger than just a result at stake and it's just an interesting one because you talk about a columbus team that won mls cup three years ago but like we're on a new thing already and it's like how quick it can move and how quick it can change and then an lafc one that has this legacy but across two different eras sort of but in a tight time span so it it, whatever happens on saturday it's going to shift i think the way we remember this time period in MLS. Let's dive in on the lineup decisions and use that as our lens to examine the rest of the game. I am not of the opinion that Steve Chirundolo has any real big ones to make. I think he'll run it back. Yep. Could he surprise us? If he was to surprise us, how would that be? Dave, can you make the case for Bogish starting in midfield over Tillman or, or Acosta? No. Yeah. I can't. Not in this game. Like, not on the road. So maybe at home you could have. I think it would almost – it would be Vela coming so out it, of the team. You would drop Vela. But for – like Mario Gonzalez right now is behind Nathan Ordaz. Yeah. And I like Nathan Ordaz. He's a good young player. Um, but, man. Here's the one that I, I – did I bring it up on this show? But, like, 
if I was LAFC, I, so I, many shows. Yeah, so you know, it would be five in the back. It would bring Aaron Long in, turn my fullbacks into wingbacks to make it easier. Isn't for that them to what turn. he did in the semifinal or in the final against? Uh, Against Leon. Leon? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And then it would be great. dropping a Vela or an Olivero. Well, I, I just Vela. what does that accomplish if you're Chirondolo? I'm not that's not like a I'm not challenging yeah, you here. It, I'm just genuinely curious what you think that accomplishes. I think it takes away it on it frees the, the wide center backs to be able to chase Matan, Rossi, and Cucho without exposing the space behind them around the goal because you have another center back in there. It simplifies the decision making for Palacios and Hollingshead of when to go close out out wide, when to try and, you know, find Yaboa and Farsi rather than when to stay in. If you look at um, some of the goals the crew scored against Cincinnati, which does play five in the back. Yeah. But as the game went along, that decision making got tougher. We talked about the goal. Ian Murphy chases, you know, Matan deeper into the field and, and there's an opening. So I think it simplifies a lot of that. It, it closed down those wide areas without you actively doing anything. And with Columbus, I think the two center forwards you would have out there with Buanga and Oliveira are the threat, right? Vela, for what he's going to bring in this game, which is his ability to launch that pass, is not the one who's going to stretch the field. He's not the one that really scares you in the open field. So you still have that same exact threat. You can still push the play where you want to. Camacho gets the ball. You know, Buanga cuts the field. Oliveira allows him to his left. Then you close down. I think you could still do a lot of that stuff. So that's what it accomplishes. So I just looked at the numbers. They've played with five at the back three times this year. They have no wins and no goals scored. <laughs> I don't think they're going to do it yeah. in this one. I, I, I pulled the numbers like maybe three weeks ago for Columbus because right. teams have been mirroring them all year, and I think they lost their first game against a team that mirrored them. Um, by mirrored, I mean play either a 3-4-2-1 or a 3-4-1-2, but either a three or five at the back. Um, they lost their first game and they're unbeaten the rest of the year against back five. So I don't, I don't think there's any chance Steve Chirondolo does that. And if they're, if he does actually do that and they don't win, it would go down as one of the worst tactical decisions in MLS Cup history. 2017, Greg Vanny played every game with five at the back, and he went four at the back for MLS Cup. Yeah, went with that diamond. Yeah, it worked. It, it was great. Yeah. So there, there is precedent but, but his was how could he fix the issues from last year yeah right he was reacting to something versus steve Torondo has had pure success over the, the course of this run why is he going to change things up that's the one that's the only wrinkle i would throw out there otherwise i think the storyline is Torondo has set a pretty clear direction the team has rallied behind it and there are not a lot of mysteries which simplifies the game for them they know how they're going to play going in against every opponent now. They know everyone's role. They We've talked about it on Monday. That midfield three, the reason it doesn't – you don't acknowledge the conversation around Bogush is all three of them fit perfectly to close space down and play against the ball. Tillman is not going to pull you apart with passing. He's on the field because he's great against the ball. Though he did hit that pass that led to the Cooch, or the Bowanga goal against Seattle. Yeah, and he hit the pass for Vela that he hit the right. crossbar on. But all of those were pick up the ball – First pass is direct, right? It's not trying to break down a low block. It's not setting the pace. Uh, they're on the field for set pieces and those reasons, and the team profile fits perfectly behind it. And so I think that's why they are confident in who they are, and it's what makes this game interesting. Is like we kind of know how both teams are going to play. Ben Olsen talked a lot about the back press of those two midfielders, in particular Tillman and Acosta in the lead-up to the LAFC game. I do wonder how effective that is against – Darlington Nagby, for instance, and Aiden Morris. But if you can catch maybe one of those fullbacks in a position and turn them over, those are the moments where I think the crew are pretty vulnerable, where the ball turns over, all of a sudden both both midfielders are forward, and it's like, hey, if we find one outlet pass. I mean, remember Shande Silva in that second game of the yeah. first round? Find one outlet pass, and you are in 1v1 situations with three center backs that, Most likely to put not. it kindly, Most most likely one of the center backs will be out of position at right. that time. Like, you know, Marrero's up here, like, making runs along the front, yeah. whatever it is. I mean, those are the situations that scare me for Columbus and, and where LAFC has really, really found their footing. But I, the thing is, though, Columbus, we talk about Wilfred Nantes' game model and his philosophy, and, like, the, the one thing underpinning all of it is 
we want teams to back no, press 100%. us. No, 100%. We want, like, send Tillman and Acosta hunting the ball when it's on Morris's foot or net, or even Camacho, Amundsen, and Moreras. We want them because it's easier to beat 10 than it is 11. And we have absolute certainty that we will beat the first wave of pressure, at least the first man. And once they do, they go really direct. It's not the tiki-taka thing that we saw from Houston. I loved watching Houston play. No disrespect to Houston, but Columbus, the reason they had 67 goals and Houston had 51 isn't just the difference in quality in the attacking third. It's also the difference in philosophy in terms of what you're using possession for. So it's just as I think you could make a very strong argument that the entirety of this game is how can Columbus possess the ball and not leave them exposed to Boanga on the break. I think it's just as easy on the other side is how can LAFC press up and create turnovers or even back press and create turnovers and not run themselves out of the play in the exact way that Wilfred Nance wants opposing teams to do. What's the 11 for Columbus? That's where there are question marks, and it's because of the difference that Gressel and Ramirez made, certainly off the bench in Hell is Real against Cincinnati, but for Ramirez, two straight games, bringing something different, occupying center backs, making more traditional, quote-unquote, nine runs, chemistry with Cucho that yeah, I think Rossi sometimes shows, but I'm not sure anybody else on that team has in the same, like, wow, we just intrinsically understand each other in a different way. What would you do? Would you start Ramirez? Would you start Gressel? Or would you you run it back the same as he has Matan and Mo Farsi? I would start the same two that you have. You've been winning. It's working. Um, you know, Christian Ramirez works off the bench. Like, that is an element. You can't walk away and say, oh, well, then we have to start him. And I think we heard for two years about Greg Vanny and Dejan Jovalich of he's a super sub, he should start. No, he's a super sub. Now, I think Christian Ramirez is capable of starting on this team, but it fits. It's worked for you. It's a change of pace later on. And I actually think with the way LAFC has played, if they don't change things up like I talked about, I actually think this game's even more comfortable for Matan in that space because he's the one who would come in he and out of the really team. really good. But he, he was really good. And he wants to connect around the box. He wants to find the give and go. But even the last... 20 minutes, 25 when he minutes. Deeper. Yeah. yeah. But that was, you know, overload, whatever. LAFC, I, I would be surprised if he ends up in that role for yeah. most of this game, would be your hope. But I think, like, you saw at times his, him struggle against Orlando in decision making in that final third. LAFC are not compact in the same way. They won't have as many numbers behind the ball in a lot of those moments. And I think it fits as well for him to try and interchange with Cucho and interchange with Rossi, try and find slip passes, get into the channel, try and find pullbacks. Um, I think all of that, while it won't be easy, it will be there. And that's, uh, I've talked about it a lot with Wilfred Nansen. You talk about his game model. Like, I think it is a prize fight. He is working from the first bell to the last of like, where am I going to find the, the, you know, the, I don't know enough about boxing. I don't know why I got myself into this metaphor. The knockout punch. It's not just like, can I create the goal in the first minute? It is like the 1,800 passes we complete in the You're setting up the jab. final third. Set, okay, yeah. yeah. Set up the we'll jab. eventually the jab to set up the hook. Yeah, we'll yeah. eventually get us that final moment where we get the goal. And I think Matan is a huge part of that. So that's that one. The Gressel Farsi one, it's a debate. I think if you don't bring Ramirez in, Gressel's crossing becomes a little bit less effective because you don't have Ramirez to get on the end of them to occupy center backs. And it feels like what has happened is there's less confidence in Gressel as a defender in that group and that Farsi with his uh, technique and ability on the ball to keep possession, even though he gave up the ball for the goal, has enough trust where he fits in alongside Marrera and um, he's earned that spot and I don't think he has lost it. I want to bring it back to what you said about LAFC maybe not having as many numbers behind the ball as what the crew faced in Orlando. I mean, that's not what we saw from LAFC the past couple of weeks. Past couple of weeks, they parked everybody behind the ball. Yeah, it just felt like Seattle at home are not capable of playing through it, but that there were gaps. And I go to like it, there was four or five plays where Chiellini plays, makes an unbelievable play, but he's on the edge. Right. There was two where he stepped forward onto the top of the 18 to read the play and win the ball that I look at Columbus who are better in moments like that and think that they could take advantage 
of those spots where Chiellini steps forward for, against Rossi or Cucho, and they get the quick layoff, and they're able to get in. And Orlando was resolute in not allowing that at all. Plus, I think they're a little more physical in those moments where I don't know that LAFC are going to foul in the same spots or be overwhelmingly physical in the same spots. But I could be 100% wrong. Even on. Orlando, though, in that same situation, desperation defending was... Yeah, you had Jansen in 18 blocks. Was saving yeah. them over yeah. and over. Let's talk a little bit about Chiellini because Wilfred Nancy went on a sort of a... I don't know, rant's not the right word, but he was asked about Chiellini and he just sort of lit up yeah. in his pre, uh, pre-game press conference saying that the Bonucci... Chiellini partnership was a quote unquote masterclass that he so exposed bummed. his so bum Benucci's not here yeah would He's have been well, yeah moved from Juventus to uh, Union Berlin anyway sorry Weeby said it was a masterclass hire Nesta in the as coach and sign <laughs> Benucci there you go. Matt Doyle and his respect for Chiellini's yeah. way of defending in the box the bumps that you don't see yeah. the moments to throw someone off the Ability to read the game. Steve Trendolo has talked about in the days leading up to this game the amount of tape that Giorgio consumes and how he's a great example for all the other players on that team. I just wonder what Chiellini is pulling out of yeah. what he sees of the crew, of Cucho's tendencies, of how to pass off runners, of the communication that he'll need to have, not just with Mario, but of course with Ilya, of the roles that both those fullbacks will play in all of this because one of the strengths of LAFC is – the athleticism and sort of shape that they're able to create in shifting extremely quickly and how that will play against a crew team that's trying to shift you and trying to get you a little bit unbalanced with their movement and their passing and their ability to drive forward. Chiellini's a fascinating part of this game. It's going to be so interesting to see what he takes away and how he applies it. He's, as Wilfred said, right, one of the highest IQ defenders in history going up against what we are saying is the best attack in Major League Soccer. Like that's strength against strength. That's what we sign up for. That's why we want to be here. And so, like you said, what is he going to see over the course of the week to say this is where I can take advantage? You talk about the Jansen blocks. A lot of them are not the first uh, attempt at the shot, right? A lot of the Columbus attackers will fake and fake and fake until they get their window, or Cucho will rip 13 shots on his first touch. But you don't know which one you're getting. Chiellini's going to have to figure that out. He's going to have to decide that, and, and that's what's fascinating about this game. One of the things I love about Chiellini, by the way, in MLS is like he ri- he he finds a way to make people so enjoying being around him that he's able to, I think, get away from some cards because everyone just laughs. Mm-hmm. And like he's an oh, ex- George, He just sets this tone and with people, right? He's laughing. He's putting – even him and Ricky Pooj are – in the second matchup after the Payaso thing, they're hugging, they're laughing. Like Just in- wait till Lu- Luis Suarez is here, my friend. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> true. Well, it's not his fault, maybe. I don't know. Um, it's just he sets this like tone in the conversations and the actions around him, and I think you'll have a Columbus team that comes in with a decent level of um, respect for him based off what Wilfred Nance said. What's the possession split? We played this game for Houston LAFC. I think 70-30 is the obvious. Yeah, I think that's sort of your baseline yeah. at this point. All right, Star Spotlight, we have danced around it a good amount. Denny Buwanga, Bue McDaniel hit us up and said, how good is Buwanga seriously? Even his off games, he looks like the best player on the field. I'm trying to remember guys who have been as good or dominant in MLS history. Am I wrong, or is he really a Mount Rushmore MLS player? This is a Mount Rushmore season, right? This goes up there with... What Joseph. Vela did in 2019, Joseph, Joseph in 20... Well, Joseph did it back-to-back. Back. Joseph did it in 2018 and 2019. Um, Jovinko. Jovinko, 2015. Yeah. Pescadito, 2002. Um, and then probably 97 or 98 Echeverry. Like, we're, like, the inner circle of the top tier of seasons in MLS history. And it is for the reason that Bo said. He, like, even when he's not sharp... He's still so dangerous, and it, like he just has gravity. The, like the the comparison is, is Steph Curry, right? Like everywhere Steph Curry goes on the field for Warriors, like the defense has to shade over that way. And it's the same thing with Buanga. And the reason is that goal against Seattle. I don't think it's a goal for any other player in the league. And it's it's amazing because he plays on the left side, and in theory even in the Curry comparison, is like, okay, well, everyone's going to shade over there and and try and stop him. So you have to go and find the game other places. That's where the Seattle one is fascinating. You're like, no, he scored on the – came off the left wing. Like, he's so good 
that you cannot stop him even if you load up to do it. And I think what we saw in the Vancouver series is just, to Doyle's point, like how terrified everyone is if he touches the ball with four yards to start picking up speed, that it breaks the entire game. You've got left backs coming across the field trying to help. You've got center midfielders recovering but not watching the runners around them. And even if they don't score in that moment, it's now set off a trigger of like, we can't let that happen again. Yeah. So now as the game goes along, you're readjusting, you're readjusting. And what has happened is that LAFC around him have gotten very good at taking advantage of those failure cascades. I think particularly Tillman is very good at picking his spots and understanding that, well, if, if all the attention is out to the left side, then there's going to be a, a you know patch of grass here where I can get on the ball and either you know be opportunistic with a goal or hit the type of pass that we saw Ended up on Vela's foot, you know, inside of two minutes against Houston. I will give Houston credit. I actually thought they did as good a job on Bawanga as I've seen anyone do this year. Now, that did open up space and time for Carlos Vela because you yeah. were so focused on that. But shading over, routing him into a midfielder, having your center back already in position to slow down that run, those are things that you have to do realistically. But this crew team, think about the way they shape. It's probably Aiden Morris in midfield, Marrera, and that, that right center back spot. <laughs> this is Mo Farsi. And if I'm, I'm sorry, out, Stephen Marrera, but like you just make sure you will your testament, your final testament and will is done <laughs> before you get there. Because he is gonna be under if, it. if I am Chirundolo in LAFC, I am trying to essentially bait Stephen Marrera into that into that run out of midfield. You saying, don't have to bait him. Well I know, Fernandez telling I him. I know, to but do like it. routing it to him to say, you come forward. Yeah. You join the attack yeah. because if you join the attack, we need one ball. Yep. That's it. And Ilya can hit it. And Kirlini can hit it. And Acosta, if he's dropped deep, he can hit it. And Tillman, can, we saw Tillman hit it. And to the thing about Ben Olsen, I think the back pressing here is on those center, wide center backs, not because Herrera and the way, as long as he wants the ball and what he does with it is different than Nagby, right? One, Nagby's not going to lose the ball. Two, he's not going to kill you from a deep spot with a pass. The back pressing is going to come when Morera and Odmanson step forward. And I'm pretty sure if Buanga wins that, he can just go himself. It doesn't even need to be a pass, right? If he takes the ball off Morera, who's stepping in to try and create a chance, he's now going 1v1 against Farsi and Camacho back the other way. So that's the level of threat Buanga has in this one. And there's there's no scenario in which Columbus can shut it down. They have to outscore. And they, they have yeah, to attack. And they shouldn't try to shut it down. They like I I firmly believe they have to just play their game. And it probably means Boang is going to get one, but you got to trust your guys to get three. And as good as I um I thought Houston was in that, they took Dorsey out of the play a little bit. Houston did. Yeah. And as much possession as they had, they did not have that extra line breaker, that overload, whatever you want to call it, because Dorsey was a little bit on his heels. I think Buanga recognized all of that. I said it on Monday. He came inside a little bit to let Vela go out wide, and all the focus on Buanga. Had that great chance he set up. Opened up Vela. So I I think Buanga read that game well, but my assumption is he understands he can't do that twice because they were going to have their chances at home against Houston at some point. Houston wasn't going to take advantage. Columbus on the road is a different challenge. I don't think Mo Farsi – I I don't think Columbus period is going to be conservative. No. They're not – it's not going to be like, oh, we're so scared of Denny Bawanga that, Mo, you're just not going forward this game. Like, that is so antithesis to the way that Wilfred views the game once his outside backs to play is the entire reason that Mo Farsi is getting starts over Julian Gressel is his ability to stretch the line and get to that in line and threaten in that way. So you just you don't you don't take it off the table. If they weren't going to do it against a team that started Barial and shifted the entire game for a top ten chance creator, just openly attack as much as he wants, they're not going to do it in this one when they come home. And God so, bless, man. Yeah, so good. A- it, it's not going to happen now. I will that can say, kill you. Though. I will like, say, it almost did. Well, here's the conversation Columbus has to have: when you foul Dennis Buanga, it has to be deeper on the field, because one of the things Buanga brings to the game is LAFC are an elite set piece team. He makes the fouls in the final third, or if you give up a corner kick on a play where he attacks, it's a victory for you. Then LAFC has a chance on those set pieces. So the moments that Farsi, Aiden Morris, Nagby, Marrera recognize, uh oh. The foul has to come close in midfield. It cannot be after he's already made a 30-yard run because now you've put Kellen Acosta and Vela on the ball in the final third with Chiellini and Murillo in the box and Hollingshead. We gave a lot of time to Cucho and his place in the league. Do we need to hit Cucho again in this star spotlight or can we move to X-Factors? Because set pieces was one of our Let's X-Factors. just go real quick on Cucho, and we've said it all year long, but 
the, the thing that has made him so special is the ability to be a match winner, whether he's playing as a true nine or dropping off and playing as sort of a nine and a half or even sometimes a true 10 or sometimes just coming in off the wing, off the wing. And it makes it, you have to have, I think two or three different game plans defensively for this team because their best player has the ability to do that. And then the other guy, specifically Rossi, I think has done a really good job of reading off that. And Rossi's much more of a soccer player than he was, you know, three, four years ago with LAFC. His ability to find space is still there. You know, run through the lines and find space that way is still there. But his ability to find space and, and make game changing plays in the half like in the half spaces between the lines, um, that has hit a different level. How you prepare for that, uh, man, it takes a sharper soccer mind than mine to, to to figure that one out. But the good news for LAFC is they have Giorgio Chiellini and they have Steve Torundolo and those guys have played a few games between them and the back line against really good attackers. I'm that- pretty sure since Rossi left LAFC, there are only three players left on the roster that he played with. That are non academy players. Vela, Palacios. Do you want the third one? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Maria. Oh. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, guys in situations that are going to have to face off against him who have played him in practice all year, but it is wild just to think like he was an LAFC. He was, you know, a huge part of it. And it's basically a completely different group. Zach Brown, should Diego Rossi score, will the club legend slash golden boot winner? celebrated against his former club. Mm, I didn't even see that in the rundown because I didn't look at the rundown. <laughs> uh, what do you think? You yeah, have to sell. Know. It's it's a it's a cup final at home. At home. I think you Rossi's have. not run, though like a backflip guy. You run to the Nordeca and you Yeah. You hug your teammates, you, you, yeah. Show the badge and you do that thing. <laughs> they sold they sold Girl's it. I was like just give me the celebration. Yeah, give they sold it. It's not like it ended poorly or any it's like hey, you know it came to an end at the right time, but it would it would be a little bit like disappointing to see that moment blunted by uh, performative loyalty. It'll yeah. be it, one of the fascinating things about the crew is like they have all the possession. You know they are going to be on the ball, and yet somehow they find a way to get behind every team at least it's once. It's awesome. <laughs> and so Cucho, it was Cucho last game down the right channel. Um, it was Rossi, obviously against Atlanta. It'll be interesting to see which one it is. And like we talked a lot about the Jordan Morris chance against Seattle. I would take Rossi, especially Cucho, in that chance. Do they cut across Chiellini and try and draw the red card? Do they go to goal? Like, what happens? They, they're pretty much every game Columbus plays, no matter how much you're focused on it, they get one chance. X-Factor time. Uh, set pieces. Let's start there. I do think that this is an area of not insignificant concern for the crew, given their struggles just with balls in the air. Uh, Schulte struggled on that. Their center back core is not exactly, you know, chock full of ball winners, and LAFC have clearly shown in the course of this playoffs and otherwise that – set piece design and just having that little bit of a nose for where balls fall. And, and Ryan Hollingshead being the primary guy in that sense is uh, pretty elite. I guess no one thinks this. We even bring it up. The other thing that could happen is you could start Zawadzki at left center back, who's a little bit better in the air and slide Amundsen out wide instead of Yaboa, which is what they did at Atlanta. Uh, I think it's the only time. How'd that game it. go? Yeah, they lost that game. Yeah. Just saying, it's an option. Zawatsky is better, has helped them sure. deal with balls I just, in the I air. Still, both Zawatsky line, still not. ultimately converted midfielder. For sure. It doesn't make Zawatsky them Zawatsky elite. versus Mario or Chiellini. Yeah. That's Dunk City. Yeah. Two, two goals hunting. in two games on the road against the two best teams in MLS. It's tough to justify any kind of backline changes, though. To your point, Weeby, um, LAFC is a wagon on restarts and the crew are not great defensively on restarts for all the, you know, we're waxing poetic about both these teams from open play. There's probably, there's like a better than 50% chance this game is decided on set pieces. And if that's the case, it's going to be decided in LAFC's favor. So what happened last year, yep. right? LAFC scored three. Both of like, They were the two best teams in the league on set pieces. I think since or fi- Philly had given up like two all year long. And they gave up two in that game. Two in that game. Yeah. Yep. How about going to my deck here? Christian Oliveira as an X Factor. Still haven't seen him be a goal scorer, a goal creator with his movement mostly and his ability to pressure. Could this be the game he is a goal scorer? Yeah, and when, when we talk about Buanga being the threat and the one, 
if someone else steps up and scores in the run of play in that LAFC attack, that would take them over the top. Yep. Like we talked about, Buanga will get his. He will get his chances. He will most likely get his goal. If Oliveira can finish a lot of the chances that fall to him, which are a lot of them are credit to him, right? His ability 1v1, his reading of the game, the way he chooses to find space across the front line when Buanga is sort of causing chaos. And then Vela, who had his chances. But I think for Oliveira, he is, the hope is, he's on the Buanga you know, pathway of last year. Buanga came in. He found the chances. He just couldn't finish them. But it was a new country, new league, new club. But he was still a difference maker for them. The pressure he put on, his skill, his ability. I think that's what Oliveira has been this year. He's obviously a little younger. The hope is next year he explodes and gives you double-digit goals and maybe more and assists. Uh, but it could come early. And if it comes in this game, I think that might be a little bit too much for Columbus to overcome. How about Carlos Vela? I mean, what, he has... Two goals all time in the playoffs, and they came in one game that happened four years ago. He had two great chances inside of 15 minutes against Houston. Uh, he has been a pretty good playmaker in these playoffs. He has not been a goal threat or a goal scorer at all. He's been at least a little bit threatening. I, you know, I think the criticism of Vela as someone who doesn't really show up in tournament play, it seems pretty valid. Like, I was there for that Gold Cup final in 2009 in the Meadowlands. I was there. When he was the greatest player in the freaking world <laughs> for 90 minutes. And like, he but it was against Logan Paws yeah, and Clarence fair. Goodson. But, like, he spent it all in that game. You know, and like, the, the, the Carlos Vela story, if you're, if you're scripting it for LAFC, the Carlos Vela story ends with him getting a goal and an assist and LAFC winning their second straight MLS Cup on the road. But... I I don't think he's that guy anymore. Um do you think it ends? Is this it? I I would I wouldn't be surprised if he's back. He, so it's it's kind of wild. LAFC only have two DPs. So they've spent this entire year with the DP slot open. So they could still bring him back as a DP and then add one more on top of that. I think it's most likely like you like living in LA. We like you on the team. Yeah. Who else is giving you an? Can offer? we find a number that works for? But because he's not, he's not a six, seven million dollar player no. a year anymore. He, he but he did make that. So he did for <laughs> he a did. long period of time. So maybe he's got the uh, reserves. That you I say. would happily take a quarter of that. Sounds like drinks are on Carlos Vela. That is what it sounds like. Adam Weeby, Morris. Weeby, which which Vela do you think is going to show up? I the same Vela we've seen all year. Okay. I, I don't think there's some like. Super Saiyan Vela that's coming out of nowhere on the road in Columbus. But it was time. his. He had the two. He took the two corner kicks in the first half. Yeah, that he did. It's still an. A, it's still an effective, talented player that yeah. has a level that's higher than just about anybody else on the field. But if, it's if just we not were dominant. To, if we were to list the attacking difference makers across these two teams, Cucho, I think at best he's four. Rossi, Buanga. Yeah, right. then he's probably. I would probably that. take Oliveira as a difference maker in this game before I take. Before I. Take I would Vela. take Matan. Over him, yeah. So I would, I would take, I would take Vela somewhere in the four to six or maybe yeah, seven yeah, range just, because Christian Ramirez as well. Yeah, it's it's a different challenge. Camacho is a different athlete than the other guys he's faced off against over the last few weeks. He's um, like an athletic peer, but he's been phenomenal. Yeah. Camacho's reading of the game, he's been uber aggressive when he can't in can't lose moments where he could have dropped off to keep the Columbus attack going. He has elevated his game. He's been incredible, um, but he did have to come out against Cincinnati. So I think you also have to have a conversation of like, if this goes to extra time, it would be Columbus's third straight extra time game in three weeks. Aiden Morris as an X factor. Yeah. I brought him up last year, last week, just because to me, I, I've said this, I already know what Dong Nagby is going to do. We think we know what Cucho is going to do. Most of these guys, Morris has a larger, uh, frame of, of where he could fall and I think it affects a lot Columbus's ability their ceiling has to be with his ceiling and so far in his MLS career three of his best games have been in the biggest games he's ever played and he was dominant in 2020 MLS Cup when he didn't know he would start and hadn't been a full-time player he was unbelievable against Orlando in that game as well I just threw an extra game in there I don't know yeah I was gonna say is. actually the interesting part is that the maybe this hell is real game is among those and he was the guy taken off to get yeah, but I think that was more just like Game State's getting an yeah. attacker in there. You're not going to take Nagby off. Then, re then specifically, Morris was bad. He wasn't, it wasn't great. great. Yeah. yeah, 
He wasn't great, but we've seen him be one of the best players on the field before in an MLS Cup. Yeah. We've seen that from John McCarthy, at least in a brief stint. How about the goalkeepers? Patrick Schulte, Maxime Cropeau. Is there a world where Steve Chirundolo would go to, you know? Absolutely. PK John for the... I, I absolutely think... And Johnny on the spot. Chirundolo is maybe one... Nobody liked that as no. much as I'm yeah. dismissed. Oof. Chirundolo is maybe one of the few coaches in the league who I think would do that. It's a very German thing to do. Is to be like, no, uh, yeah, Maxime Cropel. I know you've been like one of our best players and emotional leaders throughout this uh, this MLS Cup uh, playoff run. I, I know that um, you're probably burning up inside because you didn't get to do it last year. And I know that you've uh, had some good moments in PK shootouts in the past. John McCarthy is subbing in for you in the 119th minute. He's the, just better. And the other thing is. LAFC have not used their full subs. Right. So, like, the reason you don't do that, because, like, the last game, Pat Noonan was just trying to get bodies on the field. He needed to. LAFC, outside of Chiellini and, and Vela, are, are pretty young, guys that could play the full game. They haven't really dipped into their full bench. I mean, we saw Ordaz come on and off in a game just a few weeks ago. So they haven't really been, like, pushed. So that's where you see, if you get to that point of the game – and one of the theories behind it is a, it's a mind game, and the other is don't have Maxine Crapo working on just watching PKs, where John McCarthy can spend the whole week sort of working on that. And it obviously worked out for them against Philly. All right, prediction time. I think we've gone as deep as, well, we could go deeper, but as deep as we would like to go, given time is money. But you got crew, LAFC, extra time, PKs. Um, I Put it on the line. I will take Columbus at home, playing the way they're playing, um, the atmosphere that it'll be behind them, the way they've just been so committed to who they are and so much confidence and so much trust. Um, I'm going to choose to believe that they can play up to that level once again and come out and play strong from the start. I don't have a regular time or extra time thing for you. I'll say it, I'll put the line at three and a half goals and I'll say over for the game in total. Boy, I would take that. Nice high, open, high-scoring game. Two great teams. Uh, Hart says Columbus just because I, I love the way they play so much. Head says LAFC. I feel exactly the same. Their strength. Oh, Columbus, congratulations. Because every <laughs> time you guys go against me, I normally yeah. win. Uh, for all the reasons that we just listed, we, I just think that LAFC's strength match, matches up against – I mean, technically it's actually Columbus's strength, their ability with the ball. But Columbus, they – they leave themselves open for those moments in a way that I've never seen from an MLS Cup winner. And I think this LASC team is too good at ex exposing those moments and, and turning them into goals and turning goals into wins. Uh, one note before we finish up this segment. Uh, we haven't talked about previous matchups because this, these two teams have only ever played, was it twice in the regular season? I think three times. Maybe three times. Yeah. Most recently in the, the first half of 2022, which was, you know, a million years ago, essentially. It was before Wilfred Nante, before Cucho, before Bowanga. Trundolo was still trying to figure out how much of his approach he could graft onto what was still really Bob Bradley's team. Um, I think LAFC have won all the meetings, have never given... Apparently one was a friendly pre-2019 season. Okay, so there you go. So they've literally only played twice in competitive games. Yeah, so like it, it's, just, it's just not relevant. That's why we haven't touched on that. Felt the need. But can I just throw out there before you do this, this does feel like a video game where the final boss of uh, LAFC faced Seattle, high possession on the road. Yeah. Then they face Houston, the number two possession team in the league, or number three. Now they play Columbus on the road. Columbus went to Orlando. They sat behind but maybe not the yeah. elite individual. This is not baby Bowser anymore. This is the real then thing. Then they went and played Cincinnati, that next level. They go down 2-0, but they fight their way back. And these are now, they are playing the best versions of the opposite styles that they will have seen this season. Really cool. I've got the Empire striking back as well. LAFC winning this one. But uh, to Doyle's point, my heart is definitely uh, with Columbus, given what the club went through, given what I think Nancy by. represents. I just, I just think LAFC are going to win it. So if you'd like to... You know, if you like to open hand slap me, Columbus crew, uh, on the on the dais when I'm handing you MLS Cup or the commissioner is, you go for it. Weeby, you get you gotta steal that cup. Say if I'm you not gotta if, grab if it I'm not a hundred yards away first. <laughs> 
All right, real quickly. Breaking let's... news: MLS reporter breaks both ankles <laughs> at yeah. final before even before the slips run, off stage. Be, yeah, before the run even starts. <laughs> yeah. 3 p.m. Eastern. Apple TV. MLS season pass coverage on site. The crew from MLS 360: Liam, Kalen, BWP, and Sasha have you there, and then they'll have a post game show as well afterwards. Game starts at four. Let's uh, quickly, just real quickly. I know Maria's probably going to kill me trying to do this, but around MLS, there is a lot of news. Tiago Almada, quote, I want to go to Europe now. Yes, in this upcoming transfer window, in case that was up for debate. I want to go now. I would like any top league if I had to choose its Premier League or La Liga, but I would like any top league. He's putting 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 the call out. Yeah, he put the pressure on. Letting him know. Letting him know. I mean, there's nothing new. No. Right? He's always always wanted to go to Europe. Yeah, and and part of having... Great players, World Cup winning players, is they are going to have interest, and that interest is going to be reciprocated. And he's right to want to go to a, a top club in a top league in the world, and I'm sure Atlanta's prepared for it. Now it's just on Atlanta to figure out the timing and the number and to negotiate. Luis Suarez nearing a one year deal with Inter Miami, reportedly a TAM contract, Ooh. signing one of his knees but not the other. I mean, he's still crushing at Gremio, he, right? He played, I think, 52 games across all competitions for Gremio this year. That's he had unbelievable, by the way. Like 24 goals and 17 assists. I think he, he led all of Brazil in assists. I mean, it, like, he doesn't defend anymore. He's not the Luis Suarez of, of his prime where he was the best defensive center forward in the world, including and also being the greatest goal-scoring center forward in the world for a couple of years. But, like, he's still really, really good. You know who else doesn't defend? Inter-Miami. So it's perfect fit. It's perfect. Fluminense purchase Antonio Carlos. So Orlando have a big piece that sort of lessened in importance this year, headed back the other way. It's a dream scenario for them to get anything for him. The hope was they signed him to the deal and he would be able to play it out. He is not a starter for them. Neither is Schlegel. They need to go out and get a starting center back. Schlegel's a fine third option, though. So you didn't need Antonio Carlos to be your third or fourth center back. By the way, Fluminense, the reigning Copa Libertadores champion, they just won it last month. This is one of the biggest teams in South America going out and buying a backup center back from Orlando City. Mauricio Pereira. And Orlando City reach a mutual contract termination. So number 10 shopping begins now, or perhaps they move Ojeda into that. I don't know, or play a different way. I think the 10 shopping has to be real, and they have to have had people on their radar starting in in like midsummer. But there have been some question marks and still are about who the manager is and also what's going on in the front office. For sure. So, but uh, one other note about Pereira. Um, yeah, the number 10, but I think they'll upgrade that. He also played a lot as a number 8. He yeah. played deeper. The more I think about it, the more I think this opens up room as a salary in terms of salary cap for Dax McCarty. I gave it to you. I'm ready for that to roll. Yeah. I love it. Right? Yeah. Both for replacing that role and, and probably then Phil's Felipe's role. So you kind of roll, you put it all into one. Because Pereira, if they brought in that 10, was going to be more of a more change of eight. pace. Yeah. Eight. Seattle in for 22-year-old Pedro De La Vega from Lanús as a young DP. He's a winger who can also play a 10. Rusnak's option is picked up. He's a full DP. TBD on Raul Ruiz Diaz's future. By signing a young DP, Seattle would open two more U22 spots. Currently, they're using one on Leo Chu. Steph Fry signed a two-year contract extension. That's confirmed. And Tom Bogert, if, in case you know that guy, says that his sources expect Ladero to stay in MLS. I've been doing the Ladero to this team talk for two months. Here baby. we go. Bring it on home. Philadelphia, uh, Nashville. Name the other team. I forgot the other ones I've said. Those are the main two. Ernst Tanner, speaking of Philly, and Jim Curtin opened the door for Alejandro Bedoya and Kai Wagner to return. Curtin, quote, we made some mistakes in communication, all of us. That's in regards to Bedoya. Now we have an opportunity to rectify those. We have to find a solution that makes sense for everyone. Talks are ongoing. You guys know how much I value and respect Alejandro. We still have a chance to do the right thing and have Alejandro wear this jersey and only this Jersey. I'm confident and hope that that will be here in Philadelphia. We mentioned the Will Koontz news as the Galaxy GM. He says the club will target younger players on the DP side, a different class than they've gone about in the past, saying it's pretty clear that uh, younger players are better able to deal with the conditions. In Getting Christian soccer. Pavone back? Well, I was also going to say, didn't they just sign Kevin Cabral and Ricky Pooch? <laughs> They're like 21. Didn't seem like the age profile was the problem. The quality of player maybe was 
or you know fit. But. And we'll finish in the coaching market. I'll throw to you guys. You can have a quick take on some of these. New England reportedly after uh, per Tom Bogert and many others, including Tom Quinlan of WPRO and uh, Seth McComer of the Blazing Musket. And New England after Gio Savarese, Caleb Porter, Robin Frazier, Dom Kinnear, and Bob Bradley going for MLS experience in their next head coach. No decision there. Any for honors there? Who would be the, the guy that you would uh, highlight? I wouldn't be shocked if any of them got the job. If you look at the New England Revolution's history, they have leaned into MLS, but mainly North American soccer experience, right? Brad Friedel, then Bruce Arena, and now you look at this list of names, all of them are in there. My guess would be Bob Bradley. Don't, don't do Jay Heaps like that. And Jay Heaps before that. Yeah, fine. Um, but my guess would be Bob Bradley just from that list of names. All right. Charlotte, Frank Lampard. Dean Smith, formerly of Aston Villa. Apparently his son plays for the Greenville Triumph and went to NC State. And Freddie Juarez, reportedly among the finalists. Frank Lampard! I, I was going to make the Dean Smith joke. Right? Yeah, North Carolina. Yeah. Four D- corners. Dean Smith coaching in, in North Carolina. Like it, it just seems right. But Frank Lampard was spotted today in, uh, in Charlotte. You have Dean Smith. English coach, never been in MLS. Frank Lampard, English coach, played in MLS. And then Freddy Juarez, non-English coach, not MLS. So you got the full scale right you got there. the gamut. Yeah. Yep. It depends on what you pick. I will say this, if they do pick Dean Smith, who's historically had pretty entertaining teams, um, one of the things Charlotte has failed on is having MLS experience in their team and like having quality that knows the league. I don't know how Dean Smith makes that better. Minnesota will stick with Sean McCauley as their interim coach as Khalid El Ahmad. Starts, I believe, in January, but uh, holding pat with Sean McCauley. Surprise, dismay. I think that the feeling when Adrian Heath was dismissed in week 34 with like two <laughs> games left. In <laughs> yeah, it was the like, season. we got to do this now to get our guy. Yeah. But no. And it has not worked out like Mm-mm. that. So I will say this, because I gave the speech about John Thorrington and having vision in CSO. If Khalid El Ahmad is the key to this is our vision, this is the guy leading the way. Not rushing into a coaching decision for him is good. Now, there's very few scenarios where a coach is better off coming in midseason. So, is this end up being you play the full year like this and then you do your Gerard Struber type thing and have the guy ready? I don't know. Maybe he's coming from Europe. Maybe he's got a guy in Europe he thinks is going to be free in the summer. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Chicago hired Frank Klopas for the full time job. I love Frank as a, as a person, have always enjoyed him. Completely understand how if you're a fire fan, going back to the interim well, going back to a guy who's already managed you, going back to a guy that they already let go, feels like going back. And for the fire, going back is – and that's – you're going down. So I don't, this is a tough one, I think, to swallow for fire fans. But, you know, they said that Frank had the culture um, side of things right. So who knows? Maybe it can, maybe it can work out. TBD. Orlando, Poppy's still technically out of contract, but we'll watch that one closely. DC don't have a coach, but they did let go of their technical director and director of scouting after Ali McKay arrived. So uh, something happened in there. Red Bulls all quiet lately on the Sando Schwartz front. And Montreal, I just have three question marks in the rundown because I don't know what the heck is going on I, so with Montreal. Remember when Olivier Renard dismissed – did we talk about this on Monday when he you dismissed LaSada? Made, yeah, it made no sense. They've never it watched LaSada But play. also, like, he's, he's, yeah, he said, we want to have a coach who play you know, the style of Wilfred Nance. Like, are they just waiting for this crew – like, are they waiting for this crew run to be over so they could hire Laurent Courtois? Yeah. Or Johan de May. Or Johan de May. But if you're the crew and you think maybe Nancy... I'm could... remembering now. We did say this. Exact same thing. Uh, there was some local Montreal coverage that said they were having a conversation with someone. I'm not giving a ton of details here. The name Bev Priestman was connected. She came up and she, yes. she shot that she down. She shot it down. Oh, Bev, come on! Shot it right down. All right. Enjoy. Listen. Yeah. I deny it as well. But you never know. Enjoy MLS Cup, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Coverage starts on MLS Season Pass on Apple TV, 4 p.m. game time. Crew, LAFC, a champion to be crowned. And we will be back in these studios on Monday to break it all down. Enjoy MLS Cup. Enjoy your weekend. We'll see you then. Adios.